See, that's logic. If you fall and break your neck, anyway, okay. Uh, mothers teach us about maturity. Eat your vegetables or you'll never grow up. Mothers teach us about religion. You better pray that stain comes out of the carpet. <coughs> mothers teach us about time travel. I remember hearing this one. If you don't straighten up, I'm going to knock you into the middle of next week. Mothers teach us about contradictions. Shut your mouth and eat your dinner. I think I've actually said that one to my children before. <laughs> mothers teach us about contortionism. Will you look at the dirt on the back of your neck? My neck doesn't turn that way. I don't know about y'all. Mothers teach us about perseverance. You're going to sit here until you eat every last piece of that broccoli or whatever it is that's on your plate. Mothers teach us about genetics. You're just like your father. Mothers teach us about the weather. It looks like a tornado went through your room. Ryland, and Laura, and Brisa, and Sheridan. <coughs> And then mothers teach us about the circle of life. I brought you into this world, and I can take you out. <laughs> mothers do so much for us, and they, those, those are little humorous examples, but they do teach us, and they are so important in our lives. And again, I want us to look at a story from the Bible this morning about a good mother. If you will turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 Kings, we're going to be looking at chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3, this is the story of Solomon. It's a very familiar uh, story to most of us. It's one of those that we teach our children. In fact, uh, Kathy was reading out of the Bible story book last night and read this to the girls, so they will hopefully recognize it and remember it. The 1 Kings chapter 3, beginning in verse 16, you'll recall that Solomon, when he became king of Israel, God told him that he would basically grant him whatever he wanted. And Solomon said, I just want wisdom. I want to rule well, basically. And so God said, not only will I give you wisdom, but I'll give you all the other things that you haven't asked for. And so that's one of the things that Solomon is known for, is his wisdom and how wise a king he was. And here in chapter 3 of 1 Kings, verses 16 through 28, we see that wisdom being put to the test. We'll read the whole passage there, but you remember the story. Two women uh, come before Solomon with a case. Both of these women were prostitutes. They both had had babies. One woman said that, uh, you know, three days after I had my baby, she had her baby, speaking of the other woman. And it says a little while later that uh, one lady rolled on top of her baby in the middle of the night because they were sleeping all in the same bed and, and killed it accidentally. And so in the middle of the night, this woman whose baby had died switched babies with the, the live baby. In the morning, the other woman got up and she looked and she realized this was not her baby. And so then the other woman speaking and said, no, this is my baby, she's lying basically. So Solomon had a choice. He had a decision that he had to make. Whose baby was it? And so Solomon thought, and he said, okay, I have the solution. Take a sword and cut the baby in half and give half to each woman. And of course, one woman said, she says, no, 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 don't do that, please. Just give, give the baby to the other woman. And the other woman says, yeah, that's fine. Go ahead, cut it in half. And Solomon said, give the baby to the woman who didn't want to cut it in half because that is its mother. There's a story of a good mother. And I want us to look at some lessons that we can learn from this story here and some lessons that we see about mothers. Here we see, first of all, two women who have made some bad choices in their lives. The Bible tells us they were prostitutes. They had gotten to the point where they had to sell themselves in order to survive. Now, I don't know if it, maybe they felt like they were forced into that or they just made bad choices. They didn't have husbands to take care of them, whatever. But I think this shows us right here that even moms that have made bad decisions in lives can still be good mothers. You know, we have a lot of people in our society today that, that have made bad choices. they made bad decisions in their lives. Maybe they've gotten themselves to a point where, you know, maybe they're addicted, or maybe they've gotten kicked out, or maybe they're prostitutes like this, or maybe they're just in a really bad situation financially, and they don't know how they're going to make ends meet. Whatever it is, people make bad choices. But you see, we can still make choices lead us to serve God, no matter what situation we're in in life. And we see that's what these women have done here. Even though they had made these decisions, they were still good, loving, caring mothers. They had been blessed with these sons. And I say blessed because the Bible tells us that children are a reward from the Lord. Psalm uh, 127 verse 3 says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Children are indeed a blessing. You know what? We can't have those children without mothers. They are absolutely necessary. But here we see these women. They were probably alone. They had no one to help them. 
But they kept their babies. They could have given them up. They could have maybe abandoned them, as we see oftentimes happening in society today, uh, women having babies and just leaving them in garbage cans out in the, the cold. You know, it's horrible when you read those stories. But these women loved their children, and they kept them. And you see, they valued them. And that's one thing we see about good mothers. A good mother values her children. Their entire argument before Solomon was based on the value that they placed on their children. The one whose baby had died, I'm sure she was upset. She didn't want a dead baby. She wanted a live baby. And so that's why she stole the other ones. The woman whose child had been stolen, obviously she wanted her baby back because they both valued their children. Children are indeed valuable. Number one, because they, like everyone else, are created in God's image. Also, because of their potential impact. In Ephesians chapter four, or chapter 6 and verse 4, Paul writes there, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, I use this verse here because if we train up our children, if mothers raise their children right, if fathers raise their children right, their potential is unlimited. Their potential, especially in God's kingdom, is unlimited. Children are also valuable because we can learn from them. In fact, in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 3, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus wants us to have that childlike faith. He wants us to have that childlike trust in him, where all he has to do is say it, and we believe it. Children are like that. You know, it takes a while for them to become cynical, for them to become untrusting, and it's because we mess up as human beings. God will never mess up. God will always be trustworthy. God will always be faithful. And so we need to become like children. Children are valuable. But another thing we see about a good mother from this story is a good mother knows her children. Go back there to 1 Kings chapter 3 and look at verses 21 through 22. The one woman who is, is pleading her case before Solomon, she says, When I got up in the morning to nurse my son, behold, he was dead. But when I looked at him closely in the morning, behold, he was not the child that I had born. Verse 22, But the other woman said, No, the living child is mine, and the dead child is yours. The first said, No, the dead child is yours, and the living child is mine. Thus they spoke before the king. The evidence that this woman presents before Solomon is that this was not my child because I could tell. I looked at him. I knew it wasn't. You know, it's not unusual for a mother to start looking at her child from the moment it's born. I, I pulled some pictures from the internet. These are two sets of triplets there. It may be hard for us to distinguish those babies apart, but you know what? I guarantee you their mother can tell them apart. Their mother can look at each one of those babies and know exactly which one it is. And it doesn't matter. Now, you know, sometimes moms get names confused. You know, you I remember growing up, and maybe you've done it yourself, mothers and fathers, and you go to call to one of your children, especially if you got more than one, you know, and, and you call them by the wrong name. We do that all the time. I call my kids by the wrong name. Sometimes I like to call names that, that don't want any of them, you know. And it's just come here, you. But we know who they are still. I can look at it and know. There's a picture. I was going to use it, but I decided not to. It's really embarrassing. But there's a picture that I guess my mom or dad every time they took it to me in the hospital right after I was born. I'm sitting there, I'm holding it, and I'm just looking at it. And I can remember doing that with all four of them, when they were little babies especially. You know, just holding them, and just look at them, and you're just kind of amazed by them, and you're taking in everything about them and looking at their features, you know. And I still do that today. I stare at them, and I look at them, and I shake my head, and I go, why, why are they doing that? <laughs> I have to stand outside, I look at them, and I say, who's children are these? Because they're not ours. Not the way they're acting. But mothers especially, they know their children. And that's what this woman says right here. She looked at that other baby, and she knew immediately it wasn't hers. This is not my child. Something had happened because she knew her baby. Mothers sometimes get names confused, but they know their children. Susanna Wesley was the mother of 14 children, including her famous sons Charles Wesley and John Wesley. You may know those names from religious history. And they had a tremendous impact on the world. And it's been said of Susanna Wesley that she prayed for one hour per day for each child. 
So 14 hours a day she's praying for her children. Now, you may ask, why didn't she pray for one, one hour for all 14? In fact, someone did ask her that one time. Why didn't you just pray for one hour for all 14? She said, because they were different and they all had different needs. Now, I don't know any mother today that would have 14 hours in the day to spend praying for her children, but this mother did. Mothers, I know you do, but pray for your children as we pray for you in being a mother. And that brings us to our next point, and that is a good mother loves her children. Go back to 1 Kings 3 here. Look at verses 23 through 28. The king replied, This woman says, This is my son who is alive, and your son is dead. But that woman says, No, your son is dead, and my son is alive. The king continued, Bring me a sword. So they brought the sword to the king. Solomon said, Cut the living boy in two and give half to one and half to the other. The woman whose son was alive spoke to the king because she felt great compassion for her son. My lord, give her the living baby, she said, but please don't have him killed. This mother loved her child so much she was willing to give it up so that it would stay alive. She was willing to let this other, even though she wanted it, she wanted to have her child back. When Solomon said, cut it in two, she said, no. And in her mind, she said, I love him so much, I don't want him to be dead. Let the other mother have him. A good mother loves her children. Listen to this story. A woman named Deborah Kemp Police said they don't know where she found the strength, but she knows. Her six-year-old daughter, Ashley, was in the back seat of her car sleeping, and Deborah wasn't about to let someone steal it and take her daughter as well. As she was pumping gas, a man jumped in the front driver's seat of her car and began to pull away. Deborah, desperate to protect Ashley, grabbed hold of the door and steering wheel and held on to the moving car as she was dragged for several blocks. I wasn't trying to be a hero, she said later. I was concerned for my baby. That was part of me in that car. Kemp eventually managed to grab the thief, pull him from the car, and beat him with an anti-theft club device while he apologized and begged her to stop. <laughs> Meanwhile, the driverless car went out of control and smashed into a restaurant. That's when Ashley woke up. Deborah Kemp suffered only ripped pants and bloodied knees. The daughter was not injured at all. The suspect didn't fare as well. He was unable to walk, one leg was broken, and the other fractured. He also suffered head injuries. Think a good mom doesn't love her children? I won't ask for a show of hands, but I guarantee you, if I did, every single mother in here would raise their hands that they'd be willing to do that and more to protect their children. Even now, maybe when they're older, maybe when they're grown, maybe when they've got children of their own or even grandchildren of their own, there's still not much you wouldn't do to protect your child and to take care of them. And we see that illustrated here in this story. Now, as we close, I want to make a couple of final points. As good as these mothers were, as much as this one loved her child, they're still human. But you know what? God is God. And he loves us even more than our mothers can, if you can fathom that. And God treats us like a mother treats their children. In fact, in Scripture, God is compared to a mother. In Isaiah 66, verses 12 and 13, the prophet Isaiah writes, Behold, he's quoting God here, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the nations like an overflowing stream. And you shall nurse, you shall be carried upon her hip, and bounced upon her knees. As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. God says, he's talking here to the children of Israel, but he said he wants to treat them like a mother treats a child to hold them, to comfort them, to bounce them on their knee, to carry them around. God wants to love his children like a mother loves her children. And God, like these mothers, valued their children. God values us. In Luke chapter 12 and verse 6, Jesus says, Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. If God takes care of the, uh, takes care of the sparrows like that, God certainly values us. In fact, that's the point that Jesus is making right here. That we are more important than the sparrows. And God knows them. And he's going to know us even more. In fact, that's the next point is that God does know us. The very next verse, Luke 12 and verse 7, Jesus says, Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. I 
I've made the joke before, it's easy for God to count my hair, okay? <laughs> but he knows us so well, he loves us so much, that he knows the number of hairs on your head. That's how intimately he knows you. Now, guess what? A mother doesn't know her child that intimately. She can't sit there and count all the hairs on that baby's head, and especially when you got girls like me that have lots of long hair. You can't count. I can count the ones that are on the floor and the ones that are in the hairbrush and the ones that are stuck to me. Okay? But God knows the number of hairs on our head. That's how much he values us. That's how intimately he knows us. In fact, Paul writes later in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 12, he says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then, speaking of the judgment of life to come, face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. One of the things that children begin to do as they get older is they start trying to keep secrets from mom. Mom always knows, doesn't she? She always, oh, we're just not on your head every day. Mom always knows, somehow. Mom always knows. You know, and you might can pull the wool over dad's eyes, you might can fool your teachers, you might can do it, but mom always knows. And all of a sudden she calls you like at the worst possible time, doesn't she? You know? Kind of went to put some clothes or get some clothes for a share the other day and found a uh, half eaten chocolate Easter bunny in her top drawer. You know? Mom always finds out. There's nothing you can keep from mom. Same is true with God. We can't keep secrets from God because He knows us even better than mom does. And that's the way that he wants it. He wants us to confide in him. He wants us to go to him with all of our problems, with all of our concerns, with all of our cares. In fact, he says, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. God knows us intimately and wants us to be like that with him. And then finally, as I've already mentioned, God loves us. Just like this mother loved her child enough to be willing to give it up, God loves us so much that he gave up his son for us. John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. God shows his love for us, and then while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 9. God's love was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world, so that we might live through him. Folks, do y'all see that God loves you? God cares about you? Even more than your mother did. I know many of you here this morning, your mothers have passed on, and today is a little bittersweet for you. But God loves you even more than your mother does. God loves you more than you love your own children. God loves you more than anything in this world, even more than holding on to his own son. Now, God loves Jesus, we know that, but he sent him into the Son. He didn't hold him back, but he sent him to the sacrifice for our sins. That's how much he cares about us. That's how much he loves us. He loves us even more than a mother does. A good mother is irreplaceable. It's so true. There's nothing better than a good mother except for one thing, and that is the love of the Father, God, and that he sent his Son for us. And so this morning, I would encourage you, if you are here, and you need to become a Christian. Let God treat you like a mother, like he wants to. Let him show that love to you. Accept that love by becoming a Christian, by repenting of your sins, by confessing the name of his son who gave his life for you before people, by being buried with him in the act of baptism, by rising up out of that watery grave to walk a new life with him. If you're here this evening and, or this morning and you've, you know, wandered away, maybe you haven't honored your mom like you should. Maybe your mom tried to bring you up right and, and you've abandoned it. A lot of people do. Honor her this morning. More importantly, honor the commitment you made to God by coming back to Him, by repenting of your sins, by coming back into His fold. If you're here and you just need prayers for strength or for encouragement, whatever your need might be, we would invite you to come and respond as together we stand.